Hello everyone and welcome to the ISTBS 2021 digital event series. Today's research student research seminar will be hosted by graduate researchers at Virginia Tech at the Dynamic Mechanics Multibody and Vehicle Systems Laboratory. So in general, the plan is for the students to present them their work and followed by a live Q&A question answer session. However, you can post your questions in Q&A at any time. Moving forward, I'd like to start as I'm the first person presenting, I'd like to start with my presentation. Uh, so yeah, the title of my work is Comparative Study of the Effect of Treadle Per Compound and Tire Performance on Ice. This is a topic that was not covered as a part of the previous week's uh, uh, research seminar hosted by Professor Kodina Sandhu. I'm Mohit Shenvi. I'm from TMVS Laboratory at Virginia Tech. So firstly, one of the reasons of motivation of studying the tire performance on ice is there are a higher number of accidents and this increases the dependence on the skill of the driver. Uh, further, the, according to the US DOT report uh, between 2007 and 2016, a total of 156,164 crashes have occurred leading to a 521 average annual fatalities. Another interesting objective was to investigate the individual parameters that affect the tire performance and benchmark the accuracy of the in-house developed models like ATEAM and ATEAM 2.0 against the classical models. An attempt was made to parameterize the magic formula tire model in order to understand the effect of the tread rubber compound on the parameters. So in general, the tread rubber compound in winter tires uh, is of vital importance as winter tires differ with all season tires and in general they have four specific characteristics which are a higher tread depth to accommodate the snow, a higher number of sipes, uh, the specific uh, use of a softer rubber compound as a part of the tread. So some of the findings from literature uh, helped us to identify what we need to keep constants uh, as a part of uh, focusing on the tread rubber compound effect. Some new factors that are difficult to control would be flash temperature, which is the instantaneous rise of temperature when a tire is moving or due to the friction, localized friction. Uh, the properties of the rubber compound affect the rubber tire performance uh, to an to a certain extent and it has historically been found that a softer rubber compound has given better performance on the on the ice and also the effect of ambient temperature and aggregates uh, can change the tire performance on ice so to accommodate for all of these effects we created a testing uh, testing scheme in which we kept all the parameters constant except for the tread rubber compound so the in-house models, uh, this is some part that was covered by Professor Sandhu last week when she spoke about TIM and ATIM. And ATIM 2.0 was a model that was developed in-house for simulation of tire performance on ice by Huda Mosevi. Uh, they, these models use the rubber property, material properties of the rubber, as well as the pressure distribution at the contact patch to predict the temperature rise, water film height, uh, dry and wet friction, and the average friction. Uh, the bench, they, these models were benchmarked against classical models, namely the models by Heho and Shapley, and two models developed by Peng et al. in 1999 and 2000. The drawback of these models is their basic formulations were modif modified as there were situations in which the point of transition was basically having a length which was beyond the total length of the contact patch, which implies no melting. But these formulations were modified to see the effects of computation on the water film height and the friction coefficient. So to briefly describe the testing setup, we have a rig which is mounted with a Kistler P650 wheel load sensor, which measures three forces and three moments. We also have a pressure pad apparatus, which uh, helps us to measure the pressure uh, pressure distribution at the contact patch in static as well as dynamic conditions. However, the resolution is not very high. To the tires, the uh, 16 tires were chosen and they were prepared by removing vent spews, 
than the running of tires with tire rotation on a vehicle for 100 kilometers with rotation every 25 kilometers in order to ensure uniform wear. And then thermo K type thermocouples were attached in the groove of tires to uh, were attached in the groove of tires in order to experimentally measure what would be the temperature rise when the tire is moving on the ice. For preparation of ice, we have a standardized five step methodology which helps create an ice bed of about three inch thickness. And ice surfaces were prepared before every test run in order to ensure similar conditions. This is a view of the finalized ice bed. Uh, we had a few material properties of tread rubber from our sponsors and we had created a design of experiments which was separated in the case of pressure pad apparatus because the pressure pad apparatus cannot handle slip ratios higher than 12% uh, leading to damage of cells. And to concentrate solely on the tread rubber effect, we kept all other parameters like normal load, inflation pressure, camber toe angles, etc. constant. And Every rubber compound had two different tires, leading to 16 tires of eight different rubber compounds. We also made uh, all the tests twice in order to ensure repeatability. So to summarize the experimental uh, results, I would say the peak value of the drawbar pull in nearly all cases occurred at about 6% slip ratio. Also, we found that ambient temperature affects the results for the two identical tires. So in case of tire F, uh, rubber compound F and rubber compound H, we tested the one tire each at around 10 degrees Celsius and the other tire, tire F1 and H3 at around 6 degrees Celsius. Though the ambient temperature drop was the same, it was found that the peak drawbar pull in case of rubber compound F was 17% reduced due to the ambient temperature drop. However, in the case of rubber compound H, it reduced by around 44%. The overall order of performance for, of the rubber compounds based on the peak drawbar pull was H, D, B, A, F, E, G, and C. Rubber compound C also had the highest amount of resistive forces normalized with respect to the normal load. And hence, I wouldn't, I would consider that to not be an ideal candidate as far as a winter tire is concerned. Also, we found a new effect, which is basically that the variation in the drawbar pull coefficient in the lower slip region uh, for all the different rubber compounds was much more prominent than in the higher slip region. So as we went to experimental tests of about 30%, the drawbar pull coefficient kind of plateaued to a small range of each other, but the variation was very much high. So in case of rubber compound C, for example, the peak drawbar pull is some 0.158 Whereas in case of rubber compound edge, as we can see, it was 0.336. So it's a very high difference. Uh, in the modeling and parameterization stage, as I mentioned, we uh, tried to uh, benchmark the in-house model to classical models by comparing the water film height with rise in, uh, uh, comparing the water film height uh, as slip ratio changed for all the rubber compounds. We checked the variance of the total friction due to the rubber compound decrease, as well as we found that the total friction also increased with the slip ratio. Uh, thirdly, we found that the classical models estimate the slip ratio for melting initiation. They call it as a point of transition, but the point of transition, uh, as I mentioned earlier, initially was out due to the computation was outside the contact patch, which basically implies there is no melting. So the classical models helped us to capture which specific slip ratio starts the starts the melting phase of low uh, melting phase in the contact patch. And this was generally around eight or 10% of the slip ratio, but they do not capture the holistic picture. As when I mentioned the different types of uh, characteristics of the winter tires. So they have this characteristic tread design and sipes, which allow it for removal of snow, but this cannot be captured by the classical models as they are 1D models. And hence, even the contact patch, it considers it as a uniform distributed line load, whereas the contact patch in general is not that way. Uh, we also attempted to parameterize the magic formula by using use of a genetic algorithm. We performed this with respect to the individual runs considering both the runs of each tire, as well as the average of the experimental tire tests on ice. We in general found that the stiffness factor and uh, the value of the angle at the origin, the BCD component of drawbar pull versus slip ratio, it increased due to the aging effect. However, the ambient temperature also, like generally we expect the ambient temperature to lead uh, to an effect on the peak value, but it also, also having an effect on the stiffness factor. This was able, this was, 
we were able to do this only because we the ambient temperature in the lab cannot be controlled currently also one thing i forgot to mention is all the tires were cooled down to around minus 25 to minus 27 degrees celsius before each set of tests was performed in order to make sure that they are calibrated and stay at the same temperature as ice this is just some of the pictures of how the atm temperature rise is simulated using matlab code this is a comparison of the experimental runs as well as the green line is basically the predicted value based on the genetic algorithm optimized parameters. The average coefficient of friction uh, produced by the Peng model and the Heho model can be seen in this slide. So to summarize the conclusions of our work, uh, the ICE study has led to findings that the tread rubber compound has its effect as the most prominent in the linear or stable region of the curve. Also, this is the part in which most of the vehicles operate. So unless it's like emergency braking or something, it's uh, the effect of the tread rubber compound uh, is most prominent in nearly all the vehicles. In the case of higher slip ratios, the effect is reduces significantly. We also were able to add highlight the advantages of that our in-house models have over classical models and an attempt to parameterize the magic formula led to findings related to how the individual factors change uh, are affected due to the change in the ambient temperature and aging in uh, in our current work i am currently looking at uh, i have completed a literature review about the testing methods to measure compacted snow properties which was presented at the 20th istvs international conference and at future possibilities, we are looking at how the drawbacks of the existing devices uh, as far as snow measurements are concerned can be overcome. Thank you. And I'd like to pass it on to my colleague, Yogesh. Yes, uh, my screen is visible. Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, good, mor uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the project title of this project is uh, Characterization and Third Snow Attributes of Tire Performance Simulation. Uh, the the importance of uh, importance of tire and uh, snow is already explained by Mr. Mohit. So I directly start with the project of objectives. Uh, the various objectives of this uh, project are uh, to establish uh, FE test setups for evaluating existing and uh, new snow material modeling using FEM and XFEM methods. Uh, to build the advanced constitute material model of uh, compacted in FEM and FEM using commercial softwares uh, like LS Dyna and Abacus. Uh, to develop a quick technique for calibrating uh, comparable FE models using uh, snow data from comparable uh, test equipments, which are already explained by Mr. Mohit. Uh, and finally, to con uh, conclude, uh, conduct the numerical simulations uh, to evaluate the snow traction test modeling uh, established from experimental data. Uh, there are uh, three methods uh, which are suitable for uh, snow modeling, uh, which will be used in this project and compare the re uh, result with the test data. Uh, the first method uh, is aggregation or ALE method. Uh, Uralian method and is particular risk method, which includes DAM and SPH. We'll discuss in detail the methods. So uh, there are many uh, drawbacks of Lagrangian and UAE-based finite element simulations, which can be overcome uh, by ALE-based finite element simulation. The advantages of ALE method are uh, the computational mesh inside domain uh, may move freely to optimize the element shapes. However, the mesh on the domain borders or uh, interface can move with materials to precisely track the boundaries and interface of the multi-material uh, systems. 
the la approach is used to perform well engineering simulations uh, such as heat transfer fluid flow fluid structure interactions and metal manifold the second method is uh, uralian analysis method used uh, to solids whereas uh, lagrangian is uh, suitable for sol uh, sorry uh, uralian is for fluids and lagrangian is suitable for solids uh, the primary idea behind the uralian elements is that the mesh remains constant as a material flow from one element to the next element uh, so uranium elements are generally used for uh, large displacement and uh, large deformation analysis so third um, is the particle based methods uh, which includes uh, sph that is a smooth uh, particle hydrodynamic method the uh, discrete element methods uh, uh, this method uh, there is no need to describe uh, nodes and elements or require to represent particular body in a uh, in the collection of points uh, in the sph method the modes are commonly referred as a particle particles uh, in the discrete element method the particle represent as a separate grain tablets etc uh, during the expect uh, dynamic simulations, uh, the discrete particle collides uh, with each other and uh, with the other surface also. Uh, this method is not applicable in the situation uh, where individual particles are subjected to complex deformation. Uh, the DS are conceptually simpler uh, than the SPH method, uh, which uses a group of particles to simulate the continuous body collectively. So uh, these uh, three methods uh, we are uh, planning to implement our uh, FE model uh, in, in project. So uh, I just started the project from August and uh, I just include the part of this project. Uh, thank you. Thank you everyone. Hello Mohit. You can just uh, stop your sharing. Okay, so thank you, Yogesh, for that presentation. Um, he went quite in detail about the different numerical techniques. Well, and he's using that to model snow. I'm using numerical techniques to be modeling mud. So hello, everybody. My name is Varsha Swami. Um, I am also from the TMV project is on the study of tire mud interactions and modeling. So if you've ever driven on mud, you know how unpredictable mud can be. Mud can be highly saturated. Uh, mud is cohesive. So if you have sand and water that is not mud, we are talking more about clay type of uh, material. Mud can be anywhere from plastic-like to liquid-like behaviors. Um, it, it, there's a lot of splashing and sloshing involved, high deformations. Um, there are strain and rate effects, and it is highly nonlinear. So, Thinking about all of this, there are so many applications of tires on mud. We have, uh, you know, our agricultural tractors going on mud. There are military trucks, you know, going on such challenging terrains, the excavator. And um, mobility on mud can be really difficult because, you know, if you get caught in mud, it can even lead to a lot of sinkage and it's really difficult to get out. So that was really the motivation of our project. We really wanted to understand the effect of, you know, the poor water. Um, in, you know, in mobility. And we did, you know, uh, what we did was look into literature and we saw that there was a big research gap. Well, usually in the chair mechanics world, we've always modeled soil to be a single phase material. We've not really considered the effect of the water in the pores. And, you know, even the experimental data that's available, it's, it's usually for dry soil or something with a little bit of moisture percent. We're looking into wet soil. So there's not a lot of data available in literature. And another thing is that there is a need for like some full scale validation with a tire on, you know, mud and, you know, we need to collect data and validate such models. 
So th this was the big research gap that I found when I was doing my literature survey earlier uh, in the summer. And based on that, we came up with this, you know, big, you know, plan for my thesis. And what we want to be doing is we want to model mud. We want to parameterize that using different tests from the geotechnical lab, like the triaxials, and have that model validated. Okay, so that's part one. Then we're going to take a tire model from, um, from FEM and have that validated, and then combine both of them together uh, in a tire mud model and use that to study the traction performance and then validate that on the Terra Mechanics rig here at the TMVS lab at Virginia Tech. So yes, th this, this is a lot of uh, numerical simulations and a lot of testing um, according to the plan right now. And right now I've been concentrating more on the modeling of the mud. Um, I started this project earlier in the summer, so it's been a few months and this is what I'm really concentrating on right now. So to um, understand the modeling approach, I guess this is one of the most important slides in the whole presentation, um, because we need to understand the Terazagi's effective stress theory. So say you have mud and you put some sort of loading on mud. Well, the whole stress that's developed is not just taken by the soil particles, but it's also taken by the, you know, the water par particles in between. So the, the total effective stress, okay, experienced by the soil um, adds to the total stress. Also, we need to consider the effect of the pore water pressure, which is really efficient. So um, the total stress is the effective stress minus the pore water pressure. And what happens is the pore water pressure, when you load something on the soil or on the mud, it's the pore water pressure that's taking all of it. It's the water particles that's taking all the stress. And what happens is that because it has so much pressure buildup, it wants to dissipate that. Now, this dissipation depends on the permeability of the soil. And when we're looking into fine particle soils like clays, the dissipation is going to be really slow. I'm talking days. So because of this, th there's this condition called the undrained condition. So this con this is really important to understand because in the undrained condition, we're going to be have the shear strength uh, strength of the material that the shear strength of the soil is going to be so less compared to your normal dry situation, and the excess pore water pressure that you're going to be seeing can also lead to hydroplaning. So let's discuss about the challenges that you know we will face when we're trying to modeling this tire mud problem. Now, first of all, we have challenges because of modeling the mud itself. We discussed about these things. Now we have to talk, I think about the challenges when it comes to the, you know, soil tire interactions. Now added to this is actually the time scale effects. Now there are both short term effects and long term effects. Short term effects are like the poor, you know, the immediate increase in the pore water pressure that we talked about earlier, and even the immediate deformation. So these are the short term effects. The long term effects include like the hysteresis of the soil, the consolidation effect, the dissipation of the pore water pressure. And at the end of the day, what exactly is happening to the tire? So considering all of this, um, I did do a literature survey and we decided that the smoothened particle hydrodynamics uh, would be the best way to go forward. And just a little bit about the smooth and particle hydrodynamics. I don't want to be explaining too much because we did talk about that earlier. Well, it is a mesh-free Lagrangian method. Yes, it's Lagrangian and so is FEM. So that means that we can couple FEM and SPH together. So that's, that's a good thing. It's also based on continuum mechanics. So unlike DEM, I'm not trying to, you know, model each and every particle. Um, it's rather that, you know, these particles that you see in SPH, they're, they're like an aggregate of all the soil particles together. It's not discrete uh, mechanics. But um, with all of this, one thing, unlike FEM, where there is, this par, uh, technique does not have mesh. So there is no mesh tangling and it allows for a lot of deformation, which is perfect for us because you know we're gonna be getting a lot of splashing and sloshing going on. So essentially, um, we have, you know, position, mass, velocity, acceleration of the particles. We use the SPH technique. This is sort of like an interpolation function um, to get the other derived uh, properties like density, stress, strain, pressure, 
things like that. So essentially we have, you know, a PDE for the momentum equation. It's a very nonlinear one. Um, like any other numerical technique, we're trying to convert this into an ODE so that we can easily explicitly integrate it in time. So um, this is the model that I'm working on in LS Dyna. It is a 3D model. Um, we have a FEM tire model, which you can see is not very well developed. That is something that I will be working on in the future. So a basic tire model over here, um, we have to have a contact model in between them. And we also need to put in some boundary conditions and really important, the mud model. So how are exactly are we gonna be modeling the mud? Well, when you're modeling the mud, you can either be modeling it based on the total strength or the effective strength. So this is this goes back to the Terazagi's um, effective stress theory. When you're doing experiments in the lab, the um, the outputs that you get can be either in terms of your total strength or your effective strength. So the data that's recorded um, corresponding to that, if you need to choose models in you know your um, in LS Dyna so that we either express the total strengths or the effective strengths. So th there are two ways to do it. When we're saying total strength, I'm not separating, you know, this is the soil particle, this is the water particle. It's just taken as one media. But when we're looking into the effective stresses, we are making a differentiation between the soil particles and the water particles. So that's the first thing. So another thing is, okay, we can have the soil either in dry conditions, right? We can have it in saturated undrained conditions that we talked about earlier, or we can also have it in fully coupled, um, have a fully coupled simulation. So a fully coupled simulation uses the Darcy's law, which I'm sure a uh, few of you would know. And this allows for the pore waters to dissipate. So when, when we talk about a fully coupled system, it's really for long-term analysis. For short-term um, short -term analysis, the saturated undrained condition is what we should be concentrating on. So right now, what I've been doing is um, the effective stress analysis in the dry conditions and effective stress analysis in saturated undrained conditions. So um, here is one of the uh, you know few earlier analysis that I did. Uh, we have a plate falling on mud. So this, this is an induced load and it's effective stress analysis in saturated undrained condition. So you can see kind of how the stress bulbs are going on over here. And um, well, we wanted to compare this to the already existing analytical results. Uh, you could see over here, these are the analytical results from literature. Um, this is the pore water pressure increase with depth, and this is the effective stress. Now, the effective stress would have both the geostatic stresses because of the weight of the soil itself, and also the induced loading because of the plate falling on it, which we can get from the Bosinesk equation. So that's that's the effective stress and both of them together make the total stresses so if we take out you know ls dyna's results for the total stresses and compare them with the analytical results we do get an agreement so this was one of the you know first green lights that i got uh, this is one of the later simulations that i did um, you can see that the tire is a little bit more advanced over here and also um this is um, really soft mud. And you can see that over here, we're in 100% slip. So the, the mud is, uh, you know, it's too soft and the tire is just kind of rotating in place. So it's it's kind of like a real life situation corresponding to what you see over here. So this brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, I would like to say that I am actually working on many things right now. And one of the next things that I will be doing is um, on the calibration and the parameterization of the material model using tests from the geotechnical lab. We are planning to do different triaxial tests. Um, we have decided on the type of soil that we are going to be getting. We're going to be concentrating on more of the fat clays. Uh, I will be also modeling for the fully coupled si uh, simulation that we were talking about using the Darcy's law. And uh, I will be experimenting with different material models. So thank you, and I would like to um, pass it on to Jyothir Moy and Hannah for their presentation.
um <clears throat> hello everyone um am i audible i can hear you oh, thank you okay um so i hope you all can see my screen um so the project that i'm that i've been working on for the last couple of months is developing robust and adaptive control algorithms in off-road autonomous ground vehicles so uh the goals that we essentially are trying to achieve in this project is to be able to develop algorithms that are robust adaptive and scalable and these algorithms basically the guidance and control algorithms must, will be deployed in an off-road autonomous ground vehicle that operates at high speed and in adversarial environments in order to do this what we need is a reliable plant model and by plant model what i mean is essentially a vehicle model and this vehicle model is expected to capture the terra mechanics forces that acts on that acts because of the interaction between the wheel and the terrain so if the vehicle goes on soil or grass or any surface, we expect the model to do a good job in capturing the forces. And by doing so, we aim to push the state of the art in guidance and control. Now, before working on this project, we have previously worked on other smaller uh, robotic platforms like quadcopters. And one of the features in the previous project was to develop fast trajectory planners. Um, the trajectory planner that I'm specifically talking about is a model predictive control. Now, the way the model predictive control algorithm works is it's basically an optimization problem. So we optimize a given cost and the vehicle dynamics are captured in the constraint equations. So the idea is to leverage the fast trajectory planner that was already implemented on a quadcopter now to an off-road autonomous ground vehicle. So to do that, we need the plant model, as I previously mentioned. And that plant model looks in the form of x dot is equal to ax plus bu. So this is essentially the plant model. And we have another C term, which for now is written, but this is my future work, where the C of T is essentially higher order terms and disturbances. Now, to develop this plant model, we needed something that could capture uh, aggressive maneuvers. Now, in an off-road condition, the vehicle tends to pitch a lot, roll a lot. So having just a three degree of freedom bicycle model was not going to be sufficient. Although a lot of uh, literature talks about three degree of freedom bicycle model integrated with uh, terra mechanics uh, equations, we went for an approach where we wanted um, uh, an, a plant model that could basically capture all of these uh, maneuvers like pitch, roll, and, and, and etc. So to do that, we went back to the drawing board and developed a six degree of freedom, a single track vehicle model for computational benefits. So the generic procedure that was employed to get the uh, equation was we started off with an Euler-Newton equation for six degree of freedom bicycle model. And what we express, the, the way we express the force and moments are basically as explicit functions of the role, pitch, and yaw. So once we evaluate these set of equations, we get extremely nonlinear equations. And then what we do is we, we identify generic equilibrium points and then linearize these nonlinear equations. So once we do that, we get the matrices A and B. And these matrices A and B can be used in our fast trajectory planner, which is basically the fast model predictive control algorithm. So after the derivation, I'm, I'm not going to go completely into, into the math, but here is how the A and B matrices look like. So we have a nine um, state vector and we have A and B matrices with a bunch of coefficients. So what do these coefficients mean? So let's take one example. For example, um, C fx comma psi. So this is basically the partial derivative of the traction force with respect to the yaw angle. Similarly, we have the other coefficients which could represent the derivate, the uh, uh, partial of the moment, the roll moment about the, uh, uh, about the pitch angle or the roll moment about the yaw angle and so on and so forth. So this leads us to the next problem. How do we get the coefficients? Now, there are two possible techniques. One would be to perform experiments in a lab, in a laboratory environment, get data for the forces and moments for and measure the pitch, roll, yaw, etc., and try to find the coefficients. But that will become extremely localized and only for a particular case, although it is quite valid. And the other technique would be to develop an, an analytical method that could be more generic and 
if we can come up with a closed form solution using an analytical approach that could be applied to any kind of vehicle or in any situation that would be of much more benefit especially as a controls person so to do so we went with the second um, route which is basically using the analytical approach so to do this what we do is we adopt a terra mechanics equation we start off with the most basic terra mechanics equation um so for that purpose we basically go for the becker wong relation now the becker wong relation is uh, going to give us the pressure sinkage relationship and at this stage we do not consider any of the vehicle slip we do not uh, we just consider this, uh, the compaction due to static sinkage and uh, by considering the equations on the right on the right side what we see is that we can get the force terms fx fy and fz that's acting in the terrain and the wheel interface just by integrating the stresses over the contact area. But how do we relate these uh, equations to the coefficients that we were previously talking about here? Because we need the partial derivatives of the traction force, for example, or the lateral forces with respect to the Euler angle, the, the Euler angle, so your roll, roll and pitch. But here we get the equations which give us the forces acting on the contact patch. So one way was to capture the effects of the sinkage into the limits of integration and then use some mathematical methods for example leibniz integral rule so those kind of techniques help us to leverage on the mathematical um, uh, theorems and give us the forces that we are looking for so to give a summary of the of developing the uh, equations of motion for the vehicle we started off with a six degree of freedom vehicle model and we got a and b matrices which was enough to be implemented on the fast trajectory planner but the the bottleneck at this point is getting values for the coefficients so to do that we went to the terra mechanics equation and we used those equations uh, to come up with the longitudinal force lateral force vertical force and the moments about the uh, x y and z axis that's the roll pitch and your moment so once we do that we are able to get some expressions and we took the partial derivatives of the forces and moments to get the coefficients and at the end what we see is we get some closed form solutions that explicitly depend on certain parameters now those parameters are on this table for example it could be the terra mechanics related parameters like kc kf and n which are directly from the becker wong relationship or c which is the soil cohesion tire sinkage um, wheel angular velocity and so on now some of these parameters are dependent on the terrain or it could depend on the interaction between the wheel and the soil or it could also be dependent only on the vehicle dynamics so what would be a better approach should we measure these parameters should we estimate these parameters how are other people doing it to answer these questions we did a comprehensive literature review and at this point i would uh, pass on the presentation to hannah and she will present her results on the literature review to answer this question thank you Hi, my name is Hannah Way. I am working with Joy Tamoy on um, his project. So while he's working on path planning, my focus is more on the terrain sensing and parameter estimation for the values that are needed for the model. Um, so for motivation wise, um, most research in autonomy focuses on on-road conditions. This cannot really be transferred to off-road because of the focus on highly structured environments, where obviously if you're off-road, it's not going to be highly structured. Um, so some of the objectives for my area is to develop a suite of sensors that can collect the data in real time. Um, also develop a model in terra mechanics that can be run in real time to be run with the path planning model and also to use parameter estimation to find any values that we cannot directly measure um, using our sensors. So for the prior work we've done is a thorough literature review on different types of sensing. 
some of the focuses in that was strain type classification. Now that means the difference between things like grass and soil or sand. Um, and some of the more common sensors used in that are smart tires, cameras, microphones, and IMUs. Um, we also looked at so soil moisture content. Um, some of the avenues we've looked at are radar and possibly satellite data. And then finally, um, we looked at terrain topology, which is like obstacle detection and traversability, and those mainly use the three sensors of radar, LIDAR, and camera. Um, so now moving on, talking, con connecting with what Joy Tomoy said, some of the um, values that we really would like are soil moisture and sinkage from the soil, and it corresponds with the Becker-Wong empirical pressure parameters and compaction, and then also the vehicle dependent values such as slip ratio and slip angle. Um, so the next part of the presentation is focusing on a few of the different sensors that we are looking at specifically to implement. Um, so one of those is the tire sinkage, is um, stereo camera for tire sinkage depth. Now this is a source from another paper. Um, they've used digital image correlation to determine rut depth. Um, some of the issues could be a lack of light, but that could obviously be fixed by an internal light source. And we would use this to be able to find the sinkage index and then using that the rest of the Becker-Wong empirical pressure parameters. Um, the next one we're looking at is radar to find soil moisture. Um, many of the previous studies have been on static tests, but there has been a recent push to be able to implement it on vehicles. Um, so theoretically, that is um, very close in the future, able to be implemented on a vehicle in real time. Um, and then again, we'd use that to find the empirical pressure parameters. Um, another sensor we looked at is smart tires. Um, typically, they use sensors such as piezoelectric sensors, accelerometers, or strain gauges in the tire, and they're often paired with encoders on the wheel. Um, so there are a lot of limitations with this. So far with the research, there has mostly been on on-road and many of those were even only tested on tire testing rigs. Um, most of them are not yet in real time and then only a few values can be found at a time. So some of the values are listed below and the, some of the sources are listed under what each source can find for each value. So just see that one tire is not a solution to find every value that you need, but some of the um, values that are found are friction coefficient, normal load, and the lateral magnitudinal forces, um, the contact patch length and location, slip ratio and angle, and terrain type. Um, so another thing we're looking at is a tire deflection measurement system. It's been previously developed at our lab by a previous student. Um, it is used to find tire deflection and sinkage using um, eight sensors that have a position sensor sensitive detector and five infrared emitted diodes. Now we are um, working on updating these sensors um, to make them more easy to use and um, yeah, easy to use. Um, so for the future work, um, this is long reaching. We want to finalize and implement the sensors, um, develop the real-time terra mechanics model, um, use parameter estimation to find any values that aren't possible, and then finally have a full implementation with George Moy's path planning model. Thank you for listening to me today. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. Uh, some of our lab colleagues are also present here today. We would like to invite them to, if they wish to speak a few words about their work. I want to thank um, all of you who all did uh, Mohit, Yojesh, uh, Varsha, Jyotirmoy, and Hannah. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. I see uh, Adwait uh, and Ekhanj also in the meeting. I think Chance had to uh, to leave. Um, if he's uh, still here with us, um, he can also say a few words. But 
um, Adwait and uh, Ekansh, are you uh, able to connect and uh, introduce yourself? Please click on the blue share audio and video button. Chance, are you still uh, able to uh, to participate? I know you have a flight to catch. Hi guys, can you see me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Advait Verukar. I am working in the TMS laboratory on multiple dynamics. So very different from Terra Mechanics. <laughs> and uh, my research basically focused. Uh, so I did my masters before uh, continuing for a PhD over here. And in the masters, I focused on uh, modeling of systems with uh, joint friction. And specifically, I worked on uh, the sensitivity analysis of uh, those systems. So basically optimization. And uh, other than that, uh, I'm currently working on uh, optimization control parameters. So basically, how can we control those systems uh, and uh, do optimization with respect to controls uh, of multiple dynamic systems? And uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Adwait. Yeah. Ekans? Sandu actually Ekansh was not able to join. Oh, okay. Some course. Okay, and I know that um, I, I also don't see uh, David and Gabriel here. I guess they couldn't uh, join us. Chance uh, is another student of mine whose name I see here as uh, attending, but he might have left. I know he had a flight to leave, and he told me he's going to leave at eleven thirty. So I think at this point, um, if uh, nobody else is uh, from our group is here to introduce themselves, we can open the floor up for uh, for questions from the audience. So do we have questions? Uh, hello, everyone. I think I'll kick off the questions and um, my questions are in the Q&A section. Um, for anyone else that wants to help, you can click on the blue share audio and video button on the right hand side of your screen, or you can type and post your questions in the Q&A tab. Um, so my first question was for Mohit and uh, Yogesh. So what's the main differences between testing and characterizing tires on ice versus snow? Because I saw there was a, a distinction between the two different uh, terrain choices that you made. Uh, so yeah, to answer your question in brief, I would say firstly, like the deformation aspect is not present as far as ice is concerned so if you remember in my presentation there was a slide in which there is an ice bed which is created about three inch thick so the kind of compressive loads that a tire induces on that specific ice bed is able to like handle them in the case of snow the deformation aspect is in play further you also need to consider uh, the various kinds of responses that us that snow will measurement of snow will reflect on the device so the, most of the de current devices have an issue as far as their measurement is concerned related to the operator variability so the kind of uh, test like though the method is standardized the, if the person using the device changes the method even to a small extent the kind of measurement that pops up is changed uh, if yogesh wants to add a few points to it uh yeah uh... I think it uh, it is uh, uh, Mohit has explained uh, all the things. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, the next 
question that I had was for, um, I think it was Varsha first. So I wrote this down on the side. So what's the time scale differences between those short term and long term analysis effects that you mentioned um, for the, the stuff that you're doing? Hello, thank you for your question. Um, the time scale effect, right. So it, it could take anything between like days to even weeks to be really honest. It really depends on the permeability of the clay. So it is dependent on which clay you're looking at at the end of the day. Uh, but um, yeah, it could be anywhere between days to weeks, to be really honest. And um, sometimes you would see, um, you know, if you're just pa passing by, you, you might see, you know, rugs on the, you know, surface. So what, what happens there? Well, you would have seen that it just the the soil on the top would have hardened and that's something that happens with clay and you know muddy type of things that's because all of the water has now d dissipated out so that would take as you can just think about it that would probably take days thanks um so what effect will that have on let's say for instance you testing so uh, basically, what I'm asking is if you will test in different scenarios where, for instance, the drying out happens and before and afterwards, is that something that you'll consider for your experimental tests? Yes, that is something that we plan to consider. Um, after the soil kind of dries out, the strength increases. So that's something that we would be seeing. There would be probably more traction uh, compared to it being really wet just immediately just after like putting water into it so yes we are planning to uh validate it um right now the focus is on more of the short-term effects um because that um if only if we could get this out of the way we can look into more of the long-term effects things uh but yes we are also thinking about doing tests outside too so um this is more of like a two to three year down the lane kind of thing. But yes, we are actually really interested in that. Thank you. Um, I see Dr. Keane has joined the chat as well. Um, I think he also has a question for you. So Dr. Keane, you can repeat your question. I think you're on mute, Dr. Keane. I should be on again now. Yes, uh, yes. Um, your yeah. mud sounds very similar to paddy field soft clay, which can be anywhere from uh, quite hard, as you mentioned, with a skin, hard skin on the top, all the way through to a plastic state up to about 20% moisture content, 29% moisture content, and then going into really uh, very wet states up to 50% moisture content, although there is a hard pan very often underneath uh, the clay. So have you looked at the papers looking at wheel performance on paddy fields very much? Some of this may apply uh, to rubber tires, but a lot of it uh, applies to cage wheels. Uh, and there'll be a lot of this in the Asian uh, journals of agricultural engineering uh, which might that might be worth having a look at if you haven't already. Yes, thank you for the suggestion. I, I do know that there have been some works on the paddy fields, and that is actually so you know one of my interests. Um, I guess my project is kind of going to be like a bigger umbrella to this because I want paddy fields to be one of the you know materials that I'm going to be looking into. So yes, that is of my interest. Thank you so much, Dr. Keen, for. Okay. Um, getting this up. There's quite a few papers in the Journal of Terra Mechanics and uh, uh, beyond that as well. Uh, the other question I had, I think, was for Hannah, if she's there. Hannah, Hannah there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, Hannah. Uh, I see you're looking at sensors and some of the ones you were looking at quite high tech. Um, I remember in the 90s, we were looking at tire deflections and longitudinal and um, uh, normal tire deflections on, on low pressure ATV tires. Um, and what we did was use a pair of potentiometers attached to the inside of the, uh, the wheel rim and then making a V formation down to the tire where they were attached. 
So by just measuring the change in length of the uh, the cords to the to the rim, you can actually get the deflection and the longitudinal uh, deflection as well. And although it's quite a low uh, tech solution, if you're just doing experimental work and investigating, uh, it's quite a quick quick solution, and it's actually quite an easy one to um, to uh, to use. Other people have used uh, that in the past. If you go back to the 60s you'll see uh, Freitag was looking at tire deflections and he used um, a, a slightly different uh, um, solenoid type uh, of, of sensor for doing more or less exactly the same thing. So that's a little bit more dual, but you only get one measurement per turn. But if you're looking at quasi, uh, um, a, a, a sort of quasi static state, then it does work quite well. Okay, we are looking to try to implement this in real time to be able to feed directly into a path planning model, but I'll look into that. Okay, there's probably slightly newer versions of, of something like that that can be um, fitted up, for example, if you're using a pair of distance sensors. You only get one uh, in, you know, the signal per turn, but that might be adequate for an awful lot of applications. So that was that thought. And, and the last one that I had was for Moet, if Mo, Moet's there. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and it was, you, you when you were introducing your work, you were looking at the um, number of accidents on roads. And uh, one of the things that you've got in the States that we don't have uh, over here and really so much anyway, is you have quite a lot of blacktop roads, tarmac, and you have quite a lot of, of non-tarmac soil roads. Is that right? I don't know whether that's the same in your state. Uh, that, well, that's the impression we, we get from from uh, uh, from films and uh, generally. Um, w were you getting different uh, sorts of accidents on different sorts of surfaces? For example, if you're on a blacktop road, then uh, lots of slipping, whereas if you're on um, a soil road, you might actually be getting more sinkage and you might be getting slightly different behavior on the interaction with, uh, with the frozen surface. Is that something that's come up at all? Uh, yes, so to answer your question, uh, it is uh, that way. So the US DOT on their website, uh, I can post, like it was a part of the presentation that I made during the ISTBS conference. On their website, they have um, they do a ten year average, and that is linked to basically um, based on the type of roads, the kind of accidents that have occurred. So the values that I stated in my presentation of one hundred fifty six thousand one sixty four crashes and five twenty one fatalities, that is specifically related to when the terrain was either ice or snow. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, if it's asphalt, if it's soil, different kinds of surfaces, what are the kinds of accidents that have occurred? What are the statistics of the accidents that have occurred? Uh, it's publicly available to you. Yeah, because I, I, if, I, if I remember a little bit of what you said before, some of the temperatures you're looking at are quite close to melting uh, temperatures, just sort of freezing. Is that right? You were looking at some of the different effects there. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's a different effect uh, if you're on a blacktop uh, road than if you're on the soil road where you might be actually, you know, breaking through the, the ice rather more than sliding over the top. And it's just it's just a thought that uh, um, it sounds as though it, it, it could become quite a complex area to look at with an awful lot of different sort of circumstances to try and unravel. Yes, so it, it will be different if the ice is on a blacktop road or um, in the case of, of soil, uh, because due to the lower body deforming, uh, the ice can break. I agree with that point of yours. Okay, right, thank you. Uh, also, one thing that I forgot to mention as a part of the presentation was, uh, so the speed that is a part of our terra mechanics rig is six centimeters per second. So it's a relatively low speed in comparison right yeah. what yeah. you see in normal vehicle conditions so one of the things is the parameterized magic formula has so generally we test magic formula parameters at high speeds but in this case the parameters their validity at high speeds needs to be tested okay i'm just trying to think back that 
Uh, have you actually tried using the PAC uh, uh, magic formula yet, or is that something for future? Um, towards the future, no. Actually, in that specific project, our uh, uh, in future work, we what we want to do is ideally we want to see which specific uh, how the specific composition of the tread rubber compound itself. Uh, affects the kind of traction performance because the kind of material that is used as a part of the tread rubber compound they, there are additives that are added for sp some specific reasons you add some material in for like reducing rolling resistance or some to like basically make the compound harder so yeah so that is ideally what we would like to look into as future okay because i'm just thinking back that um a chap that i know bruce mclaurin um, he did a few modifications to the Pieca model. I think there's a paper about 2014, but it was more for off-road military applications. But it was off-road, and there may be, if you've not looked at it, there may be some aspects there which are um, of, of interest. But I think it was using the basic, if I remember the Pieca model, you've got, what, three or four basic constants? Hmm. And uh, a, a, a sort of uh, um, sinusoidal type of shape of, of some form and uh, you can control that with the constants you use but I think he was looking because he spent most of his work was looking at relatively large military vehicles he was uh, probably applying it more to those sorts of applications but there may be a few ideas there which um, could be of interest I don't know um. Thank you. I can have a look at that. Bruce McLaren, 2014. Something like that. Um, he's now retired. Uh, well, he retired uh, two or three years ago. So, um, but he's it, it, it had quite a lot of experience. So it's it's always useful to sort of see what he's got to say. But uh, yeah, I think that was the, the main things. I see we're getting quite close to the ending time. So I'll probably disappear and, and leave you to um, take over. Andrew, so you taking over now? Uh, yes, Dr. Keen. Um, I, I still have another question, so we we can okay. extend this a little bit longer. That's it's no problem. All right. Well, I'll leave you and let you carry on with that one. Thanks, uh, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Keen. Um, so, my last question, at least for, I believe it's pronounced Jotermoy, or something. So, does your model try to follow? A global path directly or do you use a local path that tends towards the global path mm -hmm. um the reason why i'm asking is i'm currently struggling with something some similar problem my right. my thesis is based on off-road vehicle dynamics control uh through integrated chassis control of the vehicle so mm -hmm. um i have both semi-active well i have semi-active suspension um differential braking as well as rear wheel steering and the issue that I'm facing now is specifically the path following. So in the past, I had it where if the vehicle is over here, but the path is over here, then um, I gave it as global coordinates. So the, the, the path is basically, I assume that it, it's get, it's um, received from a different part of the stack of the problem. And then it tries to follow that. But I found that initially what happens is it gives very large um, steering inputs uh, especially so now i'm trying to uh find a what's what i call a local path so essentially it's a trajectory that starts at the vehicle and then gradually merges with the um the global path so do you have some similar uh, so option? um okay so the idea that we're doing is we're trying to implement the stack that was used in the quadcopter onto the ugv so as far as the path planning is concerned, I can tell you what we do in the quadcopter, but we haven't uh, done the path planning yet for the UGV. So in the quadcopter, it works in a GPS denied environment. So wherever the quadcopter takes off, that's in that's calibrated to the starting point. And then we give it, uh, we give a, a goal set essentially. So we give a goal point and then we, in the code, we essentially give it a small tolerance. So we make it a goal set. So as long as a quadcopter is anywhere within like, I don't know, maybe two to 3% of the expected goal point reaches them so the way it works is we have a stereo camera and it does a slam algorithm so once it takes off it tries to reach that goal point and the coordinates are updated on a local occupancy grid 
and the path planning that we use is in a star algorithm basically okay yeah uh, unfortunately the the part of my problem does not really consider the 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 slam aspect of it so i am assuming uh, yeah. that the slam aspect of the stack is given to the control and then i just try and follow that so mine was more like how do you select a a a local path essentially so in, in the case of the problems that i'm trying to solve it's something similar to the iso 3 triple a double lane change um for the vehicle right. where you need to essentially avoid an object in the road and i am assuming that the global path what, what i call the global path is given by some higher stack uh, that gives it to uh, the right. lower stack and then i just try and follow that but what i found is that if the actual coordinate of the vehicle initially at least is not close very close to the global stack uh, well the global path then it um can give you jerky re reactions to steering so yeah it was just interesting to uh, hear someone else's uh, opinion so i can uh, add a little more on that so the way the path planning system works in the quad corporate in my lab is it uh it, it has a tactical behavior so let's say we take the next 30 waypoints so the the global uh, uh, there's a global set of waypoints and then there's this local planner but uh, this tactical behavior can be tuned by the user to either coast the obstacles or to go away from the obstacles so it just takes a small amount of the waypoints and every time that gets updated so that that is done by the slam system so there's a local uh, planner as well that we do okay all right, cool. Yeah, thanks for, for that. Um, okay. If we have any other questions, anyone else that wants to come on screen before we wrap this up? Okay, uh, doesn't seem like we have any other questions. So Mohit, if you want to close up for your group. Sure. So coming towards the end, firstly, we'd like to thank everybody for being here and asking us wonderful questions uh, from the event perspective. Uh, we'd like to say that we are implementing as a part of ISTVS, we are implementing this 2021 digital event series with alternate week student research seminars and data mechanics bites by research professionals or professors from various universities. We invite graduate students and research professionals uh, for uh, nominating themselves to be a part of these events and uh, getting more connected within the Terra Mechanics community itself and also sharing with us the wonderful work they have been doing. The details can be found on the website istvs.org. There is a tab called News Series, which will help you to uh, get more details about it. Secondly, for the ISTVS resource initiative, we are inviting graduate students. This is uh, a resource initiative that we are uh, trying to build upon where we can create a, an open source, uh, what um, we could call wiki uh, initiative where we can contribute to our knowledge. And basically it could be a platform from where new and burning researchers could get to know the basics as well as how to stay connected and updated with the knowledge of specific areas of research under the Terra Mechanics banner. So if anyone wishes to join the ISTBS community, we uh, you can join the society through the website mentioned on this slide and through the various member logins. So thank you for joining us today. And we hope to see you in the next event under the series, which is planned for 17th November which will be hosted by the entire editorial board of the Journal of Terra Mechanics. So we wish that we can see you again during that day. Thank you very much, Mohit. Uh, thank you very much for presenting. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, participating today. Andreas, thank you also for, um, for participation and for organ organizing this uh, event and for your questions. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity since uh, we have um, several graduate students here today to invite all of you to start 
um, initiate ISTBS student chapters at your respective universities. Um, we think that uh, if, uh, if uh, there is a sufficient, um, a, a sufficient number of students uh, in one location, uh, such a student chapter would be extremely uh, useful. It will attract more students to conduct research in this area, and uh, we can spread the word about uh, the kind of work that we are doing. So uh, I encourage all of you, again, all of the graduate students attending today from various uh, universities uh, to consider initiating and um, letting us uh, at uh, the ISDBS leadership know that you started um, an ISDBS student chapter. So thank you again for your presentations. Look forward to the future presentations of other research groups. I guess this is uh, all for today. Thank you, yes. Professor Sandu. And thank, thank you, Professor. We'll meet everyone on the 17th event. The links will be shared on the LinkedIn, Twitter, and ISTVS website soon. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye.